Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 161 for Monday, April 16th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? Doing okay. okay. Wait, first of all, what, what number is this? 161. It's a palindrome again today. <laughs> <laughs> you can never just answer a question, can you? <laughs> no. No, we're podcasters, Paul. We have to provide color and context for our listeners. <laughs> Love it. Um, so how am I doing? So um, I jacked up my upper back. I have like this pinched nerve underneath my back shoulder blade, my right shoulder blade. And it's at times a total mess. Fortunately, um, when I play, I don't know whether it's adrenaline or what it is, but it doesn't hurt as much if I'm moving around. But if I'm sticking still, it just really starts to kind of like, you know, throb and, you know, have some you know, pretty nasty pain. But but I played a lot this weekend. OK. And yeah. And, and the thing is, I don't, I'm not quite positive. I think the source of it is bad posture when I'm working on on my laptop. You know, I, I, I like to sit on the couch and put the laptop on the arm of the couch and I'm kind of twisted that way. I think oh, that's it. Yeah. Could, yeah. But it could, you know, I, and actually I had a thought that I'll, I've already put on the agenda, so I won't forget about it. But but it totally distracted me in the intro of the show from uh, letting everybody know that our sponsor for this episode is tunelicensing.com, where coupon code GIGGAB2018 saves you 15%. We'll talk all about what that means in a little while, but I wanted to get that out uh, up front. Yeah, absolutely. But, y- you know, it could also be, you said you played like five days in a row or whatever. I, you know, I've found that that repetitive stress can lead to me being more susceptible to injuries when other things happen too. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't I, like, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what's happened for you, but, but well, I'm there's certain- definitely no rest and recovery time in between it, any of this. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But like I said, you know, when I'm playing in general, it, it seems to work itself out Feels for a good. little while. Yeah. yeah. So we played quite a bit this week. I actually have an interesting story to tell. So, House Rockers played our local club on Saturday night, and we have been crushing at this club attendance wise. We cut a deal a long time ago uh, when when the owner of the club, you know, he, he made us an offer and I knew we could do better. I said, well, how about if we just play for the door? Right. Um, and this was, you know, when he was just about get, this, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's turned out to be a really good thing for us. And, you know, I think it's a really good thing for him because it's quite a few people in his club buying his drinks. I think he occasionally might say, wow, if I was taking part of the door, I would have even more money. But I think he's a good guy. And I think he recognizes that we took the risk. He took the risk. And everybody is uh, everybody is 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 winning for this. But we had we'd been crushing it all winter and we had an, a very average attendance night, which was. A bummer for a few reasons for me, you know, one is, I, you know, I, I, I like to pay the guys. And so, sure. you know, that's that's a good thing. The band really played very, very well. We played a ton of new material um, and we had a lot of good, you know, really enthusiastic friends. Interestingly, th- this is the club where we doors open at seven and we play seven thirty to about ten fifteen, And then a DJ comes in and the audience kind of changes over to a younger crowd at night. It's you know an interesting model. But um, this is the first gig we had since the time change. And it was interesting to get started when it was in, in a club date when it's light out and this club has big windows so it was it was, it was light light out wow, when we got started yeah, yeah, it yeah. takes a while to create your vibe when it's that light you know when you're when it's a club date yeah it does it it totally does but i i yeah there's a whole different conversation maybe we have it today about uh pushing start times of gigs earlier like i mean and I, not any earlier than what you're talking about for this gig but you know earlier than 9 30 or 10 because i think that, like, well, you've waved that flag quite a bit that that's the future of live music, especially for kind of the target consumers of, of you know, the people who like classic rock and all that type of stuff. Exactly. Kids still like to go out late, very, very late. Totally. But but there is a huge population of people that like live music that are getting older. 
you know, that aren't quote unquote kids anymore, right? They're not under 30 anymore. Many of them are not under 40, many of them not even under 50, right? You know, so I, I really think that, that and, and it's proven out, right? Uh, by and large, uh, for us anyway, that the, the earlier start times tend to draw the people out that we can bring to gigs, which are our yeah. friends that are our ages. So, yeah. 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 So, you know, like our, our um, but there's different markets, right? So like totally, our buddy, totally. yep. our buddy, Steve Witchell in, in, in New Orleans, he plays to, you know, probably a, an interesting mix of tourists in New Orleans and, yeah. you know, locals. And so, you know, it, a tourist market for going out night clubbing might be a little bit later, but the kind of like the local where the, the base of your audience is your local audience. And, you know, this kind of wraps into the stuff that we talk about a lot about, you know, is, is nineties music, long living cover music that people will go out and see forever to the same degree that Motown or seventies classic rock, or even eighties, you know, hairband rock or that type of stuff. Sure. Um, you know, what, what is live music and who goes to see it? And I think your point is really well taken. Like, like for a lot of us who started playing again, um, or got serious about a band again, um, as we got a little bit more, you know, set in our careers, um, our audience, you know, it, it listens to that music and that's a market, right? So th yeah. there's, there is those people. And I agree a hundred percent, the, this seven thirty, eight o'clock, eight thirty times ending by about 11, probably yep. is a, is a pretty sweet spot for keeping live music vibrant. It totally is. And it, it it's interesting. I've had, conversations with club owners or, you know, restaurant owners, whatever, venue owners, venue managers. And the first time you suggest, oh yeah, we should start at like seven or seven 30. They think you're crazy. They're like, no, 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 no. Nobody wants music during dinner time. It's like, well, maybe that's not dinner time, right? Maybe dinner yes. time is before the gig. And then the yeah. gig starts because they too want to be home by 10 or 11. They understand that a gig that starts at nine Probably not home by 11 if you want to be there for the whole thing. And so, yeah, it, it can work. And a lot of people, if a gig starts at nine, like they'll say, well, my bedtime's 930. I'm just I'm not even going to go to that. Whereas right. that same person that says my bedtime's 930, if the gig starts at eight, they'll stay out till 1030. But you can't start them a half hour before they were going to, you know, crawl into bed. That just doesn't work. Well, so. it's just a different animal, right? So the types right. of people in venues that go nine thirty to one thirty is one or, you know, later is one type of thing. And there's nothing and wrong with it, but it's, it's different from, yeah. There, there is an opportunity, I think that most people haven't looked at. That is that kind of earlier show night, you know, like if you go out to see a live band, that's the hours that, that you go see a live band. Yeah, so if you're going to, if you're going to go to a concert at your local arena, the band that's what it is. generally doesn't start at 10 PM. Right. It's right. like, yeah. Yeah. They have curfew. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So like I was saying, we had an interesting night in that um, we had a good crowd of the core crowd we had was very supportive and knew us very well. Um, but that extra group, you know, of people who, oh, the house rockers are in town or, you know, that type of thing. We didn't see as much of that. And so it was an average attendance night, not an off the charts attendance night. Band played great. And then, you know, it, it just makes me think about, you know, what does it take? You know, wh why do you have this vast swing in what you might do on a given Saturday night at any different time of the year? What else was going on in town? There wasn't any, you know, big touring things. In the summertime, I find that if there's like a, you know, a big band, you know, a touring band coming through that a lot of people will go to, you know, that that will definitely eat into, a, yep. you know, our attendance. But nothing like that Arguably, was happening. But it was just the, that's the time to do the late gig. Right. If you've got, you know, like a Bruce Springsteen in town or something, man, putting on a show after, after party, the after party yeah. can work out great. Yeah. 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 So, you know, there was um, a couple of our locals that had, you know, birthday parties or things like that and went to other venues and did things. And then the usual standard amount of competition on any given night. So I guess, you know, I, I want to win every time I go out there, but the reality is, is that, you know, other factors may, may, may creep in, but I, band I, played great. I find that I can uh, second guess myself with a lot of that stuff and, and outsmart myself looking at a date in advance and saying, all right, wait a minute, you right. know, there's a, there's a hockey banquet that night and, and, or there, this other band's playing there, or this thing's happening during the day, or people are going to be too tired. And at some point, like certainly you should be aware of all those things. And if there's one big thing that you think is going to totally cannibalize your gig, then think about that. 
But otherwise, don't look at the, you know, 15 sort of things that each might eat 5% of your, you know, your crowd and, and outsmart yourself into thinking that you should like move things or change things or what it's just like plow forward deal with well, it. When we started, yeah. When we started doing the park dance event that yeah. we do that on Labor Day weekend, everybody told us you can't do it on Labor Day weekend. Everybody gets out of town. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I never go out of town on Labor Day weekend just cause it's Labor Day weekend. Right. And so if you're around, it's a nice quiet weekend. A lot of people barbecue at home. Wouldn't they like to come out? So sometimes you can be clever and prove yourself right. Sometimes you uh, are try to be too clever and prove yourself wrong. But I guess the thing is you just got to learn. You just got to like you gotta you know, keep your yeah. eyes open. Yeah. And you know, take in all the information and figure out what's really going on. But but it is hard, you know, like to, to plan for these, these monthly, you know, regular, you know, club dates and to continue to make them event. I have, a, I have one friend, every time his band plays, it's somebody's birthday celebration. You know, it's all, you know, yeah. everything is, he goes out and courts birthday business and, you know, puts a theme, you know, tonight is going to be a special night of love songs or something like that. And, and we don't, I don't do that. I just say, you know, the band is, here and we're going to bring it. I did, I did tease. We got a bunch of our, cause the way I kind of position things is we spend the winter kind of turning over our sets and, you know, getting new material. And then I, you know, I kind of share in, in the, in the email outreach and the Facebook outreach that um, we're going to test out our new material on you. And so, you know, that's one little insight yeah. of being conversational with my audience, yep. but I don't, I don't, I don't kind of go for making every single event, a special event. Yeah, that it's interesting because, you know, I've got um, a madhouse this week again on uh, Wednesday night, which seems to have become our standard night, which is great. Um, and, but it's three weeks since the, the last one. And it's always interesting to me uh, how many people come out for these things, because it really what they're coming to see is a band. Right. I mean, it's but it's not just like a four piece band or even a 10 piece band playing the same songs, it's a, you know, 20 piece band that is comprised of not just musicians, but singers and artists and dancers and performers uh, doing a different set list every time. And it really is like you're coming to see a different episode of, a, you know, live TV show. Right. Or, you know, live something. I don't know what you'd got. Yeah. Right. But but that allows the same people to come out and really actually you know, engenders loyalty because you're like, oh, I don't want to miss one because this one will never happen again. But it's really hard, right? Mm. Because I have to learn, you know, 20 songs for tomorrow or for, well, for rehearsal tomorrow and then um, and then the thing. And everybody kind of has to, you, you know, each, each singer maybe only sings, uh, you know, some singers only sing one song. Some might sing th four or five. But um, but there's all kinds of things. There's movement. There's dialogue. There's you know, I mean, it's a it's a thing. And it's, right. a, it's there's way more work put in than anyone could possibly get paid for. Right. I mean, it's just, even, you know, even though we fill the place with, you know, somewhere between, I don't know, 200 to 275 people each time. It's like it doesn't like unless we charge these people 100 bucks a ticket. There's just right. no way to pay right. for all the time that everybody puts in. But if it's a labor of love, but um, but it's interesting, you know, changing the set list, even though it's not perfect. I mean, no one expects perfection out of this. Um, we all strive for it. But it just, you know, you also are sort of everyone, including the crowd, is aware of the reality that this is not a thing that's, you know, that's going to be perfected over time. It's once it happens, it's over. You know, you you see the last time it's ever going to happen is what happens. Yeah. So yeah. you're you're almost describing to a T this this special Springsteen tribute show I'm doing on May 5th. So sure. I, I knew I wanted to do it. I handpicked and invited, you know, a bunch of people that I wanted to play with on this that I thought would be a good match to it. Um, they're putting in a ton of time. They're basically learning two hours of material. Um, and on top of that, I'll add about another half hour to 45 minutes of acoustic material. And um, uh, but it is a ton of work that you can't justify the amount of work. You sure. have to only justify it based on love. And um you know, and then we're going to go and do it. And right now I have one booked and I, I somewhat cautiously didn't book additional ones because I wanted to see how we did on the one. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, is that once we get the one done, I, there's a band and there's a willingness and there's a product and there's a show and, and, you know, I can go out and book additional ones, but it is a ton of time, you know, for these guys. And I'm actually, 
uh, you know, in, in being respectful for those times, it's different than Madhouse. We rehearsed the month before. So we started, you know, the first of April and we'll rehearse every Sunday in April. I think we have one more additional so that, one. That actually happens for Madhouse. The musicians are the only ones that come in week of the rehearsal. Everybody Got else it. is like, I mean, putting this stuff together. They're, they're probably together three days a week for the last three. Got days. It. Yeah. 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 No, there's a, there's like, I, I am, I, I mean, I put in time at home and I, all of that stuff. I, I, I certainly put in time and, and put in effort, but I am certain that if we counted hours, I am much lower on the list than anyone, than most everyone else. I, I would think. I mean, Interesting. I, we don't count hours because there's there's no benefit in yeah, just it, make you miserable, right? It would make someone miserable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's it's not. We're all happy with the amount of time we put in, and really, it's everybody's respectful of the amount of time that the others put in. So, that, like for me, I realize that a lot of these tunes are, you know, for some of these people, like I said, they might sing one song. And yep. so I have to get it right, even though for me, it's one of, you know, whatever, 22 I play tomorrow night or Wednesday night for that person. It's the one. So I'm, I'm respectful of that. Yeah. So so, you know, what you're what you're describing there is kind of this very unique thing. I, I guess artists do this in general. You know, they have a need to, to apply their art. Good people do this in general. They you know, they they volunteer their time and their skills to make something cool in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly finding this with the Springsteen gig is that, um, uh, the people I, I, I purposely asked people that I wanted to go through this with, I purposely asked people that I knew or felt would like to do it for me. And then the way I management is really a very, uh, it's, it's a very subtle thing. It's like, you pick people who don't want to let the other people down. That's just a personality trait that makes these things successful. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, if, if you choose people who purely are talking about the burden of the time commitment from the beginning, it's probably the wrong personality. Even if they're a monster musician, you know, these, there's a way to manage these types of endeavors. And so that's, that's actually a big part of it. So the folks that are working with me, I mean, they've been great. They put in a ton of time. Some of the stuff is going great. Some of the stuff needs more polishing than even I thought it would, um, you know, with the Springsteen stuff. And we've talked about this on the show. There is a unique tone to playing that music, to getting the vibe right. And, you know, I, I don't hear that music played right, what I would consider right. And, you know, like you said, you know, Burke and your band, you know, knows what right is for Grateful Dead music. And, yeah. you know, when you have your passion project, there's certain, you know, approach, touch, respect for space. There's, you know, a bunch of things that make that music what it is to the guy who really cares about it. And I have to say, I've been really pleasantly surprised um, at the nuance and actually last night was a really fun one because uh, we started out with some songs that just did not sound right at the beginning. This and as a, a rehearsal last night. Is that right? A, yeah. A Springsteen yeah. rehearsal. Yeah. And um, as, as we went back and listened to the recording, we talked about what makes it what it is. And it kind of came into shape, you know, fairly fast, which is really, really an encouraging thing. But that whole, that's, a, that's like a, you know, in addition to chops, the ability to discern nuance and feel as opposed to just playing the notes in front of you on a piece of paper. That's a that's a thing. That's a big thing. And especially with this music, it feels to me like it's a really big thing. I, I Yeah. And, you know, I think with any music like the paper is it, it, even if, if you're even reading off a of paper, that's where it starts. But it can't possibly tell the whole story. There's just no way you. It, it takes listening and adapting, especially for something which I'll call chamber music, right? Which is what we do in our rock bands. It's, you know, no, rarely are, are, do you have, you know, like six people on the same instrument like you would in an orchestra. It's one of each instrument represented. Obviously, there's we can find bands that have two drummers or three guitar players or whatever. But, y you know, each person is playing their own part. You don't have four people on the same part. And so it's this chamber music where you've got to use your ears and listen and adapt and all of that stuff. And uh, and it takes more than just reading the notes on the paper and playing it exactly as it's written. Absolutely. Yeah. So on to another topic. I have a really an interesting uh, discussion gonna, to share with I'm you. Gonna, OK, cool. But first, I'm going to talk first. about our sponsor, uh, Tune Licensing. Please do. Thanks. Uh, at TuneLicensing.com. Like I said at the beginning of the show, you use coupon code GIGGAB2018, that's GIGGAB2018, 
you save 15% off of the licensing fee uh, that they that they charge. That's how they make their money. What Tune Licensing does for you in exchange for your money is they go out and find all of the people that need to be either negotiated with or paid or both uh, to license cover songs that you want to release on your own. Maybe you want to put out, uh, you know, a CD or a series of videos or something highlighting your band that you want people to be able to buy from you. If you didn't write the song, you don't own the entirety of that product, right? If, if you're covering someone else's tune, even if you're doing it your own like unique way, even if it's not a straight cover, it's still a tune that someone else wrote and you want to be protected against copyright infringement for a couple reasons. Number one, I mean, you know, nobody wants to get sued. I don't think I really like the law. I'm really interested in that. Trust me when I say you don't want to go through a lawsuit just for the sake of going through a lawsuit when you can avoid it this way really easily. But you also want to do the right thing. You want to make sure that the people that did write the song and the people that own it get paid because that's part of what we do and what we believe in here. And you don't want to have to learn how to deal with all that because it's going to take up so much of your time and you might still not be able to get it right because you might still not know the right people to talk with to get it done. That's what tune licensing does for you. They take all those headaches away. You go online, you put in the song, you pay the royalty uh, and you save 15% gig gab 2018 during checkout and you're good to go. Everything's copacetic. You're covered. Everybody else is covered. You did the right thing and you don't have to worry. So check it out, tunelicensing.com, GigGab2018 during checkout saves 15%. Our thanks to Tune Licensing for sponsoring this episode. Thanks, Tune Licensing. And you, you said do the right thing, which is actually a really cool theme of what we kind of visit in this, in this podcast quite a bit. And a perfect segue. So what I wanted to share with you is um, a bunch of musician friends and a couple of fans had a Facebook discussion. And the, the essence of the Facebook discussion was this. There is a shopping center in this area, beautiful, um, high end. Yep. And they have live music. They do not pay their musicians. You can work there uh, if, they, if they ask you to play and you play for tips, basically. And the two sides of the argument discussion actually not an argument was you know it's, it's, fa not it's cool. facebook it's more likely to be an argument than a discussion so i'm, I'm uh, actually really this glad one was pretty civil to, yeah i'm glad to hear you qualify it and, and call it a discussion that's that's yeah you know good for humanity right it was civil and informative and the two perspectives were one you know should musicians support a you know help bring people help entertain people when the venue is not invested in in compensating and the other side was a musician friend i know who plays there says i play there and i do great you know i i, I get more tips than i would in any situation you know for straight pay you know so people are very generous there it's a good you know demographic to be generous and there's a lot of reasons to do it i love that gig so th that was the two sides of the discussion one is do you just write off a venue that isn't respectful enough to musicians to pay them versus do you just say, listen, that's, that's them. But you know, I make a personal decision because it works for me and I should pay it. What are your thoughts? Um, wow. That's really, I mean, if at the end of the day, if the musician's getting paid, um, and, and there's a consistency to that and, and the expectation is managed, you know, it doesn't sound like anybody that's choosing to play there is showing up surprised at what the scenario or what the deal is. Right. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 you, we've both four walled events right before, which, which t t for the sake of, of clarity for anybody listening means, you find a venue, you rent the venue, you pay security, you, you know, do whatever you need to do, and then you can charge at the door if you want, and you collect the proceeds, and out of the proceeds, you know, hopefully you're able to pay everything and make a profit. So that's very different than being hired by a club to just show up and play. Um, this is neither one of those things, but... It's, you know, got elements of both in there where you're taking on a lot more of the risk and potentially experiencing more upside than you might otherwise. 
So like I don't I don't have a problem with this kind of thing if it's very clearly communicated. It's very clear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like in a general sense, no, but I mean I but I I do get where you're coming from on it. Like, you know, does this ruin it for the rest of us? Does it open the wrong doors? Because there is a slippery slope here, right? You know, venues that just say, okay, well, if bands are playing for free over there, then I should just be able to, you know, like, uh, you gotta, you gotta pay to play at my place and I should get 10% of your tips. Right. You know, where did, where do you draw the line? And I guess you draw the line where you draw the line. Well, so let me back up a little bit. So the, the only part where this gets a little bit contentious is that the initial the initial uh, share was a Facebook post saying, you know, I won't play at this place. And a bunch of this person's fans weighed in and was like, yeah, you know, the heck with those guys. Sure. You know, how dare they disrespect musicians? And then, you know, this one friend of mine, a very thoughtful musician, weighed in and said, you know, it really needs to be a musician's individual choice. I play there. I know the deal. I willingly take the deal. I do great. I get a lot of privates. I get a lot of tips. It works out. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm accepting the responsibility of what it does. Um, but I can say that at the end of the day, you know, what they provide is reasonable. They provide a very well-heeled audience, you know, a, 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 a demographic that has gotten money. I get my privates out of it. It creates a lot of business for me. This would be an example of it's a it's a known quantity where playing for quote unquote exposure yep. really works for me. Yeah. Well, and that's it, right? It's, it, this person's playing for anybody that plays there is playing for the opportunity for tips and the opportunity for exposure. There's no one that the venue provides. I don't think maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't sound like the venue's got someone there hawking your name and, and, you know, running around with a tip jar, collecting your tips for you, nor are they saying, Hey, this is, you know, look, Paul Kent's on stage. You should book Paul Kent. Hey, look, that's Paul Kent over there. You should book him. Right. Like that's up to you. So the opportunity is there. And for some people, capitalizing that on that opportunity is part of what they can do and part of what works for them and for other people, not even a little bit. Well, this is that interesting thing about um, do when artists get, get wrapped up in principles and I'm not going to actually even take a position on one side or the other, but I, sure. I can see clearly what's happening is yep. musicians can take the position you are being disrespectful to the craft of being a musician and therefore you should not be supported. And, you know, the other side of this is, well, you know, it is what it is. And I can go busk on a street corner in a low uh, economic opportunity or in a high economic opportunity, you know, which would you do? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Right. Would you busk anywhere? And if the answer is no, then don't do this gig. That's not right. It's not part of your shtick. And and yep. to be fair, some musicians are way better at this than others. You know, if you're someone that can engage a crowd uh, in a in a split second, if you can whip requests out of your head and really entertain and 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 trap, not trap, but but draw people in, then you're probably going to do really well at this. But if you're someone that's, you know, shy and really good at doing what you do in terms of playing and singing or whatever it is, but you're not engaging in that way, then this is absolutely the wrong gig for you. That's right. But this is also a gig where you could learn to do that, too. Right. It's trial by fire. And I think that's a valuable skill to have as a musician, almost a mandatory one at some level. Yeah. And then, you know, the the related lesson here is wherever you may fall on the scale of, you know, uh, principles versus opportunity. um, Once you take it to Facebook and get fans involved, it gets emotional and can get testy. And so be really cautious uh, about your approach to doing that. Yeah, there is, you know, ever since we humans sort of stumbled into the concept of a flame war back in the BBS days of the 1980s, I I don't think we've been truly able to resist or evolve beyond that. Um, When when we see something that is wrong and the person is not in front of us for us to speak with and it can happen in a text form, especially where people can sort of pile on with different points of view in an asynchronous way we're doomed every single time bulletin boards it happened it happens on facebook it happens on twitter it happens like reddit 
to, to Reddit's credit, that's actually their entire business model. Like Facebook stumbled into it, right? Reddit, man, this was what they set out to do was capitalize on the fact that people want to argue with each other about, you know, right. things. So it's it's a natural thing. And like you said, you got to be really careful when before you give in to that impulse or desire to open that door and just vent a little because that's all any of us want to do is just I, I want to say something. And so I'm just going to vent a little. And suddenly you find yourself entrenched in something that's far bigger and far more disastrous potentially to your own relationship with your fans and your reputation and all that stuff, just because you felt like, Oh man, this frustrates me. Can I say that it frustrates, you know what I mean? Like you gotta be really careful yeah. of that. Yeah. Well, it, it is all about that uh, confirmational bias, right? Like to get a little bit off the track here. It's all about it's truly yeah. when you're, when your worldview is threatened online, Everybody's brave online, right? Everybody, <laughs> you know, has that sense that they that, that, wait till you see what I'm going to type. And, you know, it's it's uh, I think about this a lot. Obviously, the political climate that we're in right now, this happens all day, every day, everywhere. And it's um, and but I don't know that we're really moving the needle. I don't even think we're making ourselves feel better defending our confirm our confirmational bias. Nope. So in the, in the realm of being a musician and in these areas where, you know, we have this unique access to our fan bases and other people's fan bases and our community of people that we work with or compete with or anything like that. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. And, 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 you know, word to the wise is understand that that's what happens. Like if you want to state something that is your position in the world, you know, if you want to say, I, you know, I won't play at this place because they, 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 they did this to me. Um, be prepared that, you know, you stating that is going to inflame somebody's worldview, you yep. know, be careful about when you understand it, be careful and understand that when you state um, something as an absolute, um, if it doesn't strike somebody else as an absolute, you're probably going to hear from them because it's, there's no, there's no barrier to entry for them to respond. Well, that that's the thing. And, and it's, it, you, you have to sort of to crystallize what you were saying. You have to consider the repercussions of of this, right? Because you might be totally right about, you know, Club A screwed me in this very specific way and I'm going to complain about it. And I'm also going to con at least convince myself that what I'm doing is a public service announcement so everybody else knows, right? Whether or not that's actually the case that we convince ourselves and off we go with our with our well-crafted rants, right? <laughs> and, and And then we hit publish. And three weeks later, you know, the club B that we were talking with stops returning our phone calls. And, you know, it could be and I've seen it where it's because Club B saw you post about Club A. And from their standpoint, it's like, well, I, that see, could what, be me. I see what they're saying about Club A. But did Club A intentionally screw them or was that just like sometimes things go sideways and no, you know, there was no bad intention here, but this happened. And did this guy even try to resolve it? Like, you know what? I've asked too many questions that I don't know the answer to. There's 16 other people that want to play my room. I, I'm just going to go with one of them. They, they, they want to play. This guy wants to fight online. That's cool. You already have your platform. My stage is for other people. There you go. Yeah, right? It's about... Yeah. I mean, you got to be careful if you if your brand is about being the paragon of truth and, you know, that people this is what people can expect from me. If they come see me, I will always speak my mind. When you take that into a virtual format, I mean, that might be yeah. an interesting thing on a face to face conversation oh, in, in the <laughs> room. Totally different. Right. You know, yep. especially if you're on stage and you're, you know, doing your thing. I mean, there's long storied history of of performers that that were. That are, you know, uh, politicians in their own rights, you know, and using their stage as a platform. And I mean, the 60s sort of defined that. Right. And and it's con it's continued since. But yep. like you said, Facebook, man, <laughs> it can ruin people. It definitely can. Yeah. So we're we're learning, you know, mankind, musician kind. It's an evolution of how to understand how to use these tools. They're really awesome for many things. They're brutal for many things. They're brutal. I, I, I'll, I'll take us on a little tangent because I've always thought about this. Think about the, the driving, right? Now we have 
rules and laws and you have to have a driver's license and, you know, cars have to be built a certain way to be safe, but also compatible with each other and all that stuff. When that technology started out, it was just like, could you, can you afford a car? Yeah. All right. We'll get one and drive it on the paths that exist. Like, and, and there was no concept of stop signs or the rules of the road or right of way or any of that. And, you know, we're like, that's where we are with this, especially this like social technology and just the, the ethical and societal impact of all that stuff. We're really early. I, I think of the, the four way stop concept as a really advanced concept in driving, right? We all show up there. We all know what to do. And by and large, what we do at a four way stop works and avo- at, at its sole purpose, which is avoiding collisions, Right. I don't think we're at the four way stop point with social media yet. I don't think we've figured we haven't had enough collisions where we need to sit down as a society and say, hey, so when we find ourselves in this scenario, can we all agree on how we do this so that we don't, you know, wind up killing each other? (laughs) We aren't there yet. Clearly, we're not there yet. That's my that's one of my you know, I think too much sometimes as i said in the beginning of the show i outsmart myself way too often so well this is uh, episode 161 which is a palindrome <laughs> <laughs> hey uh the thing that i mentioned at the beginning of the show was uh, or that i mentioned putting on the list at the beginning of the show when i uh you know i said the intro and i hit play on the uh, on the theme song and the theme song played and that's good because that's how it's supposed to work um But this is the first, the way my podcast schedule goes, this is always my first podcast of the week. And usually my last one is on Tuesday, right? So uh, it's been, you know, six days since I've used this gear, sometimes even six days since I've sat in the chair at, at this machine. And the gear that I'm using here, especially some of the outboard compressors and stuff are easily five, if not, you know, more years old. And so I had this thought as the music played, like, certainly when one of these breaks, I replace it, but it'd really be better if I replaced it ahead of time. And, you know, when it like, but I don't think about this compressor when I'm doing everything else that I do during the week. I think about it today and it worked for this show. So I'm assuming it's going to work for the one I do later today and the one tomorrow. And then, you know what? It's like, yeah, then it goes, you know, in the in the virtual gig bag and I wait until the next gig and I plug it in and hopefully it works. And like there's very much a a direct relationship between that, what I'm doing here and, and what we do at our at our actual like gigs where we go and perform because you're bringing this gear and man, if it doesn't work the way you expect it to, like reliability is important and nothing lasts forever. And I know we've talked about, you know, bringing spare gear and all that stuff, but it just got me to thinking about, wow, you know, proactively replacing gear. How, how, how far Mm. out, like, what do you, what, what does it take to make you think, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that hi-hat stand is a piece of crap now. Like that thing, I'm lucky it makes it through a gig. I got to get a new one. And like, that'll happen to me in the middle of a second set. But the next day at lunch, I'm not thinking about it anymore. It's in the sure. it's in the hardware bag. It's good to go. Like the next gig I set it up, it's like, oh, uh oh, is it going to. OK, good. It's going to work. You know, uh, that gets even more like with a hi-hat stand. It's not so bad because it's truly a mechanical piece of gear. Like fixing it on the fly is is possible, not necessarily easy, but possible. Whereas something that's solid state or, or even, you know, uh, anything electronic like that's not necessarily easily fixable at the gig on the fly. So I don't know. What do you, do you think about this stuff, Paul, or do you just, uh, you just, you know, hope that the music gods smile on you and every now and then you buy a new amp just cause you want a new amp. Um, it's a great question. And here's the <laughs> and way I'll, we should here's all I'll knock on wood as I'm, as I'm asking these questions. Right? Well, no, everybody denies that Murphy is on the payroll, right? Murphy's law is, <laughs> is waiting for us around every turn, but I bring two guitars to a gig in case I break a string. Right. I don't bring three, but you know, there's a certain amount of failure that is likely and certain amount that's sure. unlikely. Sure. And I have a set of strings after that. Okay. Um, you know, with guitarists, um, tube amps are like, you know, most of us don't know how to replace the tubes in our own amp. And uh, we assume that anything goes wrong 
with a guitar amp will be a gradual thing and we'll always have time, you know, to, before it's a, a DOA type of thing. So, right. which is not, which is not right. Right. It's, it's so not I have, always I have extra, true. Right. I have, I have extra tubes and luckily the guy I play guitar with knows a lot about this stuff and, and um, you know, he could get me through something if I needed to, I've never had an amp die. Um, Jeez, you really it's dawned be on me, on wood, man. <laughs> right? I mean, I just, I just messed myself up. Yep. I do um, have like a little guitar modeler that I throw into our, truck so if my amp did die i have one of those uh, model yeah. things that can just go right out to the board so i guess i like i that. guess there's yeah. a little bit of stuff you've got some fail but, saves um, built in okay a couple yeah. of fail saves but oh. you know not everything but no uh, i i bring at least two snare drums to every gig for this reason not uh i mean sometimes it'll be you know i'll hit the drum and it'll be like whoa this is the wrong snare for this room i should use the other one but even in that case if the snare that's best for the room dies well there is another one and snare drums like like most other percussion equipment is mechanical and potentially fixable but it's very time consuming to to repair a lot of the things that could go wrong with the snare drum so that's why i have a spare one of those exactly the same thing with a kick drum right a pedal not the drum itself but the pedal can be very temperamental so i always have a spare one of those in the car uh but other than that you know, and and I don't bring spare heads to a gig. Uh, I do have patches for a bass drum in case the bass drum pedal goes through, but I can always put a floor tom on the floor uh, sideways and hit that with a with a kick pedal if necessary. Right? I mean, it's it's never gotten to that for me. It's almost gotten there, but um, yeah, it's interesting. But you know, like PA gear, a lot of bands. Uh, really don't have enough in the way of spares that if a key piece, like if the board goes, what do you do? Yep. Right. I mean, it's like, hopefully, like you said, hopefully those things start to show themselves, but even with this, like, you know, with this compressor here in the studio, I know it's going to die. Uh, I know it's on its way out, but it, you know what? Oh, it, Oh, I got it working. Okay. It's fine. You know, then I don't think about it for a while. <laughs> and, and then I'm going to be in trouble someday, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we are, there's always a risk, but you're, but you know, you can't be too negative about it because, nope. you know, most gigs, nothing happens. Right. And right. so you kind of play in the odds all the time, be as prepared as you can have backups, have duplicates. I don't know any cover band that has a backup board. Right. Right. Um, right. I mean, you know, I bring, so. I do have like a backup, like a, a small little six channel mixer. That's usually in my, my tub of safety net stuff. And and I suppose that would suffice if, you know, if everything fell apart, but it would be very, very non-optimal. It would not sound the same. It would be f moderately functional at best. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know anybody that has a full yeah. background, you know, sound reinforcement gig. Again, we could, if everything went to hell, you know, you don't have, and it's in a club, you know, you don't mic. Yeah. And, you know, we have enough, just run, we have enough gear. And, right. Yeah. 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 You know, so, so we, we, it would be miserable. And, you know, like we have, <laughs> yep. we have background PA speakers that have, that have, uh, you know, we can plug mics right into the PA speakers, that type of thing. So, oh, that's true. I mean, there, there, yeah. there's some types of solutions that you could MacGyver your way through stuff. And again, this is the, this is rare. And if, and if you are having stuff, go wrong often you're probably not preparing for your gigs per, well yes. you know, you're probably working with wonky equipment and you're hoping against hope that it's going to get you through and that's that's you're asking for trouble yeah but yeah. i mean if you take decent care of your gigs don't throw it around too much of of your uh gear yeah. you know put in good cases and do that type of stuff i mean good stuff is built for performing for musicians this. right i mean and, and i suppose there's that's that's where the lesson is here. You know, when you're choosing gear to buy and I, I mean, I'm well aware of this even today when I buy stuff, certainly I don't want to spend more money than I need to. Uh, if I'm buying mic stands for the studio, I buy really crappy mic stands because I've learned that you can get a crappy mic stand and take it out of the box, set it up and leave it alone. And it'll be totally fine for like 15 years. Right. Because you're not moving it around. It's the right. banging it around and constantly folding it and unfolding it and folding it and unfolding it. that things wear down and then they snap and they break and then they don't work. So I buy crappy mic stands for the studio, but they're totally functional. 
where I get worried is when somebody says, oh, yeah, I grabbed that mic stand out of the studio because, you know, the the one that we had in the gig bag broke. It's like, well, don't expect that thing to work too much because I paid right. twelve dollars for it, you, you know, and it's and already six where, years old. Yeah, exactly. This is where like Bill, our sound guy, you know, he um, he if, if you are the guy who's helping him wrap cables at the end of the night, he will be on you if you don't do the diligent job because mm. he doesn't want to nest the cables and he wants the cables to last cables, you know, obviously a really interesting point of failure yeah. for a lot of these types of things, but he buys, you know, mic stands that are good. We put them into a case, I, you know, Nick, our keyboard player, both his keyboards are in a case. The drummer has all his jumps and stuff in a case. I, I now have my amp in a, in a rolling case. Nice. So it's protected all the time. You know, I have good guitar cases. Makes a big so, difference. Know, you, yeah, it does. It, you know, you're stacking the odds in your favor. If you're going to take care of your stuff. And, and that's the difference stuff. That's going to, Stay put stationary is one level of build. Protection. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But stuff that is going to get banged around, you pay for the, for it to last. And that's, that's in anything that's in cars. That's in anything, but certainly in sound gear and musical yep. equipment. Yep. Yeah. That's totally it is I, you know, the stuff I have here in the studio, I would never, I, it, I, I have, there have been scenarios where I'll bring like the, my practice kit to a gig cause it's got the right sound or it's quiet enough or whatever. And I'm super nervous about it, even though I'm happy to play it here for, you know, hours. And I probably play this kit more. I log more hours here than I do anywhere else on any other drums I have or anything. But I wouldn't trust this hi-hat stand, you know, 10 feet away from where it currently is because it's probably not going to it's not going to survive the move. But it's totally fine as long as it stays right there. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's just how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, before we ship off today, I got yeah, uh, while while we've been doing the show, a good friend of mine, Tim Allen, one of the noted bass players that are here in the Bay Area, like true pro, top light, top gigs, um, great bands, really good, great instructor. He uh, sent me a note saying we were talking about Gibson's and and quality builds and you know the issues that Gibson's having, and we talked about Slash, and he wanted to share with us that. There's actually a, a a luthier. His name is Chris Derrig, K R I S D E R R I G, who's been making replica Les Pauls for quite a while, and that's who's that's actually whose guitar Slash uses. So we should include if someone's a Gibson player out there, and if for some reason you know Gibson isn't around, you know, in, in five years, and you're looking for for uh, someone to make a guitar that's in that style, uh, Chris Derrig would be at least Slash's go-to guy, and uh, probably an interesting thing to check out. Supposedly they're they're quite expensive, but um, but uh, you know, very, very well made. Oh, very cool. That's great. Thanks, Tim. That's a good one. That's very good to know. As as the future is always, well, especially with this, it's a little cloudy, but guaranteed yeah. to change. Yeah. And so, thanks, Tim, for the note. Glad you listened to the show. And you know, again, he's like the top of the top of working musicians in this area. So when I hear that guys like that are listening to what we do, that's pretty cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Hey, if you want to let us know, uh, send us a note. Giggabpodcast.com is is where you can find the website. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com is how you can send us email. We love to get your email. Both Paul and I get everything that's sent to that address, and and we can either individually uh, or even sometimes collectively reply to things if if it's something that. It's uh, applicable to both of us or whatever. So please do come find us, come say hello. We love to hear from you. It's it, that feedback loop really, really does make a difference for us because, you know, uh, we, as much as we enjoy talking with each other, uh, it's great to hear that, uh, that you folks are we listening do it for and you. reacting. Yeah, we do, we do it for, for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's all I got today, man. How about you? That's plenty of stuff. It is plenty of stuff for sure. All right. Well, our thanks again to tunelicensing.com for sponsoring the episode once again. Great working with them and uh, great doing this podcast for all of you. Paul, what do you have to thanks, say Dave. to him, man? I have to say, always be performing. Always. <laughs> <laughs>